Tonight, we begin with the Indian stock market. It's seeing an extraordinary surge. Both Sensex and Nifty touched record highs today. The Sensex breached the 64,000 mark. The Nifty crossed the 19,000 mark. Both indices stabilized afterwards. But Indian stocks are a hot commodity. In fact, India now has the world's fourth most valuable equity market. Right behind countries like the US, China and Japan, India stands fourth. And tonight's lead is not about these daily trends. Tonight, we want to talk about the incredible bull run of Indian markets. Did you know this? Indian markets have delivered the best returns for the longest time in the world. Look at this chart. It has every key stock market benchmark of significance. The Dow Jones, Nikkei, S&P 500, FTSE 100, the Shanghai Composite, the so-called best indices in the world operating in some of the world's biggest economies. Look at their performance. At best, they've delivered a positive return for five consecutive years, meaning investors have earned a profit for five straight years in these markets. Some markets have performed better for six years. That's better than most, but not the best. Guess where the Indian markets stand? Right at the top of this chart. For eight straight years, Indian markets have been generating a positive return. For eight years, they've delivered a profit. Indian markets are leading the world. They've performed the best in more than two decades. India has two key benchmarks, the Sensex and the Nifty. The Sensex tracks the top 30 companies in the country, the Nifty the top 50 companies. In the past three months, Sensex has risen by 10% and Nifty has jumped by 11%. Now let's compare this with the rest. In the last three months, UK's FTSE 100 rose by just 0.8%. France's CAC 40 by 2.9%. Pan-European Stocks Europe 600 index by 2.9% again. And this index tracks Europe's 600 companies, top 600 companies in 17 countries. What about the US? The S&P 500 has gained 10%. These are America's top 500 companies. Collectively, they gained about 10%. But the S&P is still almost 9% below its record high of 2022. So comparatively, India is doing better. Which brings us to the question... How is India sustaining this rally? What has propelled its markets to the top? Well, two key factors, steady growth and foreign investment. India's growth projections are optimistic. Investors like the Indian economy and its future prospects. The International Monetary Fund says India will grow at 5.9% this year. It believes that India will outperform all advanced economies and emerging economies. In other words, India will be the fastest growing economy in the world. And this is not a short-term projection. India will retain this tag for the next three years at least. That's what experts at S&P believe. They released their assessment earlier this week. So the Indian economy is growing at a fast pace and for a long duration, which is why investors are taking interest. And that's reason number two. Global investors like India, they recognize the growth prospects. So they're putting their money into the Indian markets. Let me show you some more data. Last year, listed companies in India raised billions of dollars, almost $19 billion. And this is mainly through the buying and selling of shares. In 2022, Indian companies raised more money than the United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, and France. Now, under usual circumstances, these markets would have done better. But due to India's strong performance, it is generating better growth. So investors are turning to India. In this financial year, foreign portfolio investors have bought more Indian stocks. They've invested almost $11 billion. So we have a strong economy and more foreign investment. Now, broadly, these two reasons are driving the stock market rally. But this surge cannot be an assessment of the Indian economy. You see, stock market movements are influenced by the price of stocks and the larger market sentiment. Now, individual stocks do not represent the entire economy. Take the Nifty, for example. It's an index of the top 50 companies of India, only 50. Now, more than 37% of this index, Nifty, is made up of companies in the financial sector. So when these companies do well, the Nifty goes up. But when you talk about a country's entire economy, you must look at a wide range of metrics, a wide range of sectors like manufacturing, services, and other parts of the economy. So a rally on the stock market cannot really be an assessment of the entire economy. Having said that, India has a compelling story. Its companies are poised for growth, and the larger economic trend looks good. America, we know, is stagnated. Europe is on the brink of recession. China is struggling to get its act together. So India is the bright spot right now. The challenge 
is to retain this momentum. And that means staying the course on aggressive reform. And here's an example of that. What India shouldn't do, run its economy as per the whims of one leader. Xi Jinping's policies have driven China's economy into the ground. His Belt and Road Initiative led to high levels of debt. His obsession with zero COVID infected the economy. And his crackdowns on business leaders have driven away investors. The result is this. China is struggling. Businesses are leaving and Xi Jinping is trying to win them over. Today, the Chinese president made a pledge. He has promised to do right by foreign investors. Let me quote from what Xi Jinping has said. We will continue to vigorously promote high-level opening up and better protect the rights and interests of foreign investors per the law. That's what Xi Jinping told New Zealand's Prime Minister. His name is Chris Hipkins. He's on an official visit to Beijing. And she told him that China is opening up again. Yesterday, the Chinese Premier made a similar pitch. He tried to reassure investors. Beijing is trying very hard to reverse the slump, but it's not finding many takers. Especially after today's revelations. Headlines like these. A major corruption scandal has come to light. Turns out local governments in China are cooking up their books. They're inflating their revenue through phony asset sales. A number of bogus deals have come to light. Some 70 regions, 70, 70 regions are said to have falsified their records in China. They inflated their revenue by $12 billion. Let me explain how this happened. This is mainly about land deals. Now, usually regional governments sell land to private players, to property developers who then build apartments or commercial properties. This is how it works and this is normal practice. It's also a major source of revenue for local governments. But in recent months, China's real estate sector has hit a slump. So the demand for land has shrunk. Fewer developers are buying land from local governments. And so government revenue has taken a hit. And government officials have come under pressure because their books are not looking good. Some of them started cooking up land deals. They created phony buyers on paper. They falsified records and showed land sales on their books which was all fake. In reality, some officials were just transferring ownership on paper and the land in question was still in government control. It had not been sold. All they did was change the names to create an illusion of an actual purchase. Subsequently, government revenues were inflated. We are talking about fake revenues up to $12 billion. Why do you think they did this? Because Chinese officials are desperate. They face large debt obligations and they don't have the money to repay those debts. These are government debts we are talking about, not personal debts. Local governments in China are buried under loans. At the end of last year, they owed more than $8 trillion. We've told you about this before, $8 trillion. This debt has gone out of control. Land sales would have helped. But there was no demand for land. So local governments could not raise money. In fact, land sales have been an essential source of their income. In 2021, they accounted for more than 40% of local government revenue, the sale of land. Last year, sales were down by 23%, and this market may not see a revival anytime soon. So with their back against the wall, local officials started cooking their books. And this is not limited to one or two cases. As many as 70 regions in China have inflated their revenues in this manner. Now, when stories like these come out, what message do they send to global investors? The Chinese economy is built on a foundation of deception. Their data was never reliable. Now, even their growth projections cannot be trusted. The heavy burden of debt will add to the mistrust. The phony records will diminish investor confidence. There was a time when global investors swore by China's growth story. That time is past. China is now turning into an example of what not to do. We're still tracking the fallout of the Russian rebellion. Quite a story, that one. This weekend, Putin was on the edge of his seat. His country was dealing with a mutiny. And today, it was NATO's turn to be on the edge. Its eastern flank is worried. That's because of the presence of this man, Wagner Chief Prigozhin. He's now in Belarus, and so are some of his Wagner forces. You see, when Prigozhin ended his mutiny, he brokered a deal, a deal with the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko. He was promised a safe passage out of Russia and into Belarus, so that's where he is now. And his new location is making the NATO uneasy. To understand why, you must look at a map of Eastern Europe. You can see Belarus there. 
To its north are Lithuania and Latvia, and on the west, there's Poland. All of these are NATO states, and they're worried about Wagner on their borders. Last Saturday, we all have seen the mutiny of the Wagner Group in Russia. If Wagner deploys its serial killers in Belarus, all neighboring countries face even greater danger of instability. Under such, uh, such circumstances, deterrence and forward defense is a top priority. We heard those questions of, of, of uh, ladies and gentlemen here about uh, Wagner's group in, in Belarus and uh, the presence of Mr. Prigozhin in Belarus. In my opinion, this is really serious and very concerning problem and, 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 and we have and we have discussed and we have to make some decisions, very strong decision. It, in my opinion, requires a, a very, very, very tough answer um, of NATO. Those were the presidents of Lithuania and Poland. They say Wagner troops in Belarus spell trouble. They're worried about instability spilling over. So what is the NATO doing about it? Well, nothing yet. But it says its guards are up. I think it's too early to... Uh, make any final uh, uh, conclusions on uh, the long-term uh, consequences, including for uh, NATO. Uh, but what we uh, can say is that uh, uh, we are, of course, closely uh, uh, monitoring the developments, and uh, we have already increased our readiness, our uh, preparedness, and uh, uh, our military presence in the eastern part of the alliance. That was the NATO Secretary General. He says the alliance is ready for any threat. But what is the threat? And how serious? Yes, the Wagner chief is in Belarus with some of his fighters, but as of now, they're most likely figuring out their own future, not planning an attack on Eastern Europe. You see, there's a lot, lot of uncertainty, question marks on what will become of this mercenary group. They challenged Putin's power. Will he forget and forgive? Also, what happens to Wagner's global operations? This is a private army, as you would know. It has long been seen as an extension of Moscow's influence. It has operations in multiple countries, Syria, Libya, Mali, Central African Republic, Sudan. So clearly a large presence in West Asia and Africa, a presence that depends heavily on Moscow. Wagner benefits from the Russian government. Will they continue to work and fight for Russia? Will they continue their operations in all of these countries? As of now, the Kremlin says it will be business as usual. But for how long? How can a private army that challenged Russia continue to fight for Russia and be based in Belarus? I guess all of them are still trying to figure out how this works and what is the future. Wagner and Russia both need each other. Wagner depends on Moscow for arms and aid, and Moscow depends on it for influence, to keep a grip on troubled regions and to counter Western influence. So it's a fragile but important relationship. Putin cannot send Russian soldiers to Africa. He cannot replace the Wagner troops, at least not immediately. So for the foreseeable future, he may, they may remain, the troops may remain in West Asia and Africa. But does that mean that Prigozhin is forgiven? Before we try to answer that, listen to this soundbite. This is from an old interview of President Vladimir Putin. You want to forgive? Yes. But not all. What is impossible to forgive? So the anchor asks Putin, what is the one thing that he cannot forgive? And the Russian president says, betrayal. Prigozhin's mutiny was a betrayal, a betrayal by one of his closest aides. So it's unlikely to be forgotten or forgiven. A counterattack, a crackdown may not come today or tomorrow, but it will come. You've not heard the last of this. Now let's look at the other side of the world, East Asia, far away from the war in Europe, but suffering its fallout. The world is divided. Clear military camps and alliances have taken shape. NATO is fighting Russia. The US and China are in a cold war, and East Asia is emerging as their battlefront. Every day brings new headlines featuring warships, military stunts, and missiles. The latest one comes from Taiwan. Two Russian warships sailed close to Taiwan, not Chinese, Russian warships. This was late last night. Taiwan's defense ministry was on high alert. They said, and I quote,
The National Army used joint intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance methods to grasp the dynamics of the Russian ships throughout the process and dispatched mission aircraft, ships and shore-mounted missile systems to closely monitor the response. We don't know just how close the Russian warships got to Taiwan. The ministry did not specify the distance, but they were close enough for Taiwan to put up its guard. And you must understand, Taiwan is no stranger to territorial incursions. Their neighbor is China, after all. And Beijing's aggression is almost routine. Let me show you something. This is the Taiwan Defense Ministry's Twitter feed. Every day it reports incursions by the Chinese Air Force and Navy. And despite this daily pressure, the Russian vessels found special mention. Because they escalate the already tense situation in East Asia. To understand this further, we need to zoom out. To look at the region as a whole. You have the No Limits Partners on one side, that is Russia and China. They call themselves each other, No Limits Partners. They're joined by their old friend North Korea, a country that keeps testing ballistic missiles. It wants to de develop nuclear weapons. It wants to threaten South Korea and Japan. And that's what it does. So this is one camp, China, Russia, North Korea. The other camp has some unlikely partners, Japan and South Korea. They've had a difficult history, but they're trying to forget it to secure their future. These two countries are under the American security umbrella. Washington has promised to defend Seoul and Tokyo. And together, they keep holding military drills to unsettle Pyongyang. In response, North Korea fires even more missiles. And this is a dangerous spiral, a continuous cycle of showmanship. Here's the latest in that one. A U.S. submarine is visiting South Korea. Not just any submarine, it's an Ohio-class warship, the largest class of submarines ever built for the U.S. Navy, nuclear-powered and nuclear-armed. So nuclear weapons are being ferried about in East Asia, and of course, the U.S. also promises to protect Taiwan from the Chinese, from Chinese military action. So add Taipei to their camp, and what do you get? A powder keg, ready to explode at the slightest provocation, and that's exactly what the Russian warship stunt near Taiwan is being called, a provocation. As if that wasn't enough, Russia seems to be doubling down. After all this drama, Moscow released footage of a military drill in the Sea of Japan. Russia's defense ministry chose this day, today, to release this video. It shows a corvette ship shooting down an anti-ship missile. The timing is suspect and the build-up is dangerous. China versus Taiwan, North Korea versus South Korea and Japan, Russia versus American allies, America versus the Asian mainland. It's a mess and a dangerous one at that. All sides need to do their bit to diffuse the tensions because if they don't, one wrong move can send the world into another catastrophic war. Paris is on fire. People have taken to the streets once again. This time, it's about a murder, the murder of a 17-year-old by a police officer. A police officer killed the boy for refusing to stop his car. This is over traffic violations, apparently. A video of the incident has gone viral. It has enraged the French public. And that public anger has led to riots. Critics say this is becoming a trend, that there's been a rise in extrajudicial executions by the French police. In India, we call them encounters. There were 13 such incidents last year over traffic violations alone. Yesterday's killing was the second one this year, and the French people seem to have had enough. Here's a report. This was Paris last night. Violent protests broke out. Demonstrators armed with fireworks clashed with the police. The police responded with tear gas. Protesters set about 40 cars on fire. About 31 people were arrested. This chaos is the result of a traffic stop gone wrong. What do you expect to happen when you break a traffic law? Like running a red light or driving on a pavement? These things are illegal. You might expect to get pulled over by the police, most likely pay a fine. If the violation was grave, maybe end up in police custody. But would you think you might get shot and killed? Not for a traffic violation, right? Well, that's exactly what happened to a 17-year-old in Paris yesterday. 
A French police officer asked the teenager to stop his car. He tried to flee and ended up shot dead. This is a video of the incident which has gone viral. The footage is disturbing. But if you can look closely, the boy tries to drive off. He's shot as he speeds away. The car crashes up ahead after the teenager is shot. After this, he was rushed to the hospital, but he was declared dead soon after. What the teenager did was clearly illegal. There's no doubt about it. But does that justify his death at the hands of a police officer? Many French citizens don't think so. There's been an outpouring of support on social media. The French football team captain, Kylian Mbappe, put up this post. Actor Omar C tweeted this. First of all, I would like to express the emotion of the entire nation at what has happened and at the death of young Nehel and to tell his family of our solidarity and the affection of the nation. We have a teenager who has been killed. It's inexplicable, unforgivable. These are words of affection, shared sorrow and support for his family and loved ones. Macron called the incident inexplicable and unforgivable. The officer has been taken into custody. A case has been filed against him for voluntary manslaughter. He's under investigation. You may ask why France is still furious if the police officer is being punished. It's partly because of what happened after the killing. We showed you the footage from the incident. The police were clearly standing beside the car. But in the report they filed after the killing, the police allegedly lied. They said they killed the teenager because he tried to run them over. This is an extremely serious matter. This video clearly shows that a police officer shot a young man in a cold-blooded way. The police officer who fired the shot is currently in police custody. We therefore hope that things will continue in a calm manner. But we will of course be vigilant because this is a case of voluntary manslaughter and there was no self-defense. The family will file an additional complaint for false testimony. The other officer involved will be charged with complicity in the killing. And in these cases, the wheels of justice need to turn fast. Because the people of France are furious. More protests are expected today. The French government keeps appealing for calm. But the only way to ensure peace is for justice to prevail.